Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is the last session of the day of this very compact DockerCon. How has everybody loved it? <laughs> Hasn't this been fantastic? How many of you folks would like to see this next year run longer? <laughs> a lot of you. A lot, and, and I know a lot of you are tired because we compacted a lot in two, in two days, but I'll tell you what. Ladies and gentlemen, you've stayed for, for what could very well be the best. I think every conference has its rock stars, people who are really here to be, be paid to be seen. I think Brian is definitely that, uh, without a whole lot of ado. I'm Scott Fulton of The New Stack at thenewstack.io, and it is my honor to introduce this afternoon Mr. Brian Cantrell. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, I'm a little worried about high expectations. Keep expectations low, please. Um, I'm Brian Cantrell. I'm the CTO of Joyent. I do apologize to people in the back for Jesse's presentation. I was the one that whooped when Scott asked if anyone read Byte. No one else whooped, and the people in front of me jumped about a foot. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm realizing it's, we, we sound old. We need to stop. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about today about, uh, about Docker and production. Uh, the Docker revolution, I don't need to tell you about this. This is why you're all here. You all get this. Um, if you didn't get this, you had to see Jesse's talk, the last talk, uh, in terms of bundling all software via Docker. Uh, I think Docker is a very big deal. Uh, I don't think Docker is overhyped. I think Docker is underhyped, if anything. I think it's a, it's a huge change in the way we deliver software because it allows us to all think operationally. It allows us to, to express our software operationally and deliver it in a vessel that can be then uh, it can be then animated and turned into a container. An image can become a container. Um, it is, in the words of, of Roman Pachnik of Pivotal, um, it is 21st century ELF, the executable linker, linker format. Um, and I, I've said this before. I'll say it again um, to kind of non-believers, although that's not necessarily this room. Docker is doing to apt what apt did to tar, and which is not to say that apt is going away. It's not going away. Just as tar isn't going away. I mean, Jesus, CPIO has still managed to embed itself in the animal brain of computing. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, so the, it's not that that apt is going to be going anywhere. It's just that we're going to be at a higher level of abstraction. We're going to be thinking in terms of Docker, in terms of images, in terms of containers. Um, so this is a very big deal. Uh, I think it's a big deal in part because Docker allows us to deliver microservices. Services. And microservices, I know there are some people that, that immediately vomit into their mouth when they just hear microservices. And if you're kind of twitching right now, and you're like, God damn it, it's going to be one of those talks. Um, I, so I get it. I understand the nerd rage. I think the nerd rage comes because I think that microservices have been kind of uh, portrayed as a panacea. Clearly, they're not. Uh, we'll get into all the details of that. But microservices actually are at their root a very good idea. A microservice is the idea of taking a, an HTTP service and expressing the minimal effectively surface area such that you can actually compose a larger system out of many microservices, out of many of these services. And this is the oldest good idea, or one of the oldest good ideas, because this is the Unix philosophy. And when I, I wrote this on a slide, and I'm like, you know what? I don't actually need to spell out the Unix philosophy. People know what the Unix philosophy is. And then Doug McIlroy, I think, chose me as his vessel on Earth, and my fingers just typed it out. I couldn't help myself. Um, so Doug McIlroy is the father of Unix that you might not have heard of, Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, Doug McIlroy. It is Doug McIlroy that is, in my mind, the true father of Unix, because Doug McIlroy gave us the Unix philosophy. And that is, write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs that work together. Write programs to handle text streams. OK, text streams, a little dated. Or, or HTTP, J JSON over HTTP, um, because that is a universal interface. Uh, this is really profound. And this was a, it was, you think it's profound now, it's still profound now. It was unbelievably profound uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. The idea of having a much simpler system by making these much smaller parts that we could then compose. Very big deal. Um, if I ever totally lose my mind and start handing out pamphlets on BART, um, this, this is what these pamphlets will read. Um, so, OK, so this is all like happy talk. Um, and, and now that, that's going to end a happy talk. Um, I noticed it's been great. People are like, oh, the theme of, the, of DockerCon is Docker in production. Yay, Docker in production, Docker in production. OK, look, production is war. <laughs> and war is hell. <laughs> and so the, the, the people that speak rosily of production are like those that, that ginned up war in 1914. OK, war is hell. You're not going on a backpacking trip to Afghanistan. You are going into a war zone, and you need to pack your Kalashnikov. So the, when we think about Docker and production, it's important that w w the difference between production 
and development is that in development, failures, manage, ma fa failures matter a lot less. If your code fails, no one really cares, um, as my 10-year-old son is fond of telling me. Dad, no one cares. It's like, all right, thanks. I'm going to go kill myself. The, but n n nobody cares if you're, not nobody, but if fewer people care. When your code is running in production, people care. Now, it's true that production is a spectrum. And there's some production that people don't care about. It's like, oh, CI, CD. And CI, CD is great. I love CI, CD. But it also failures manage a lot less. Fail failures matter a lot less with CI, CD. Um, when, when you, similarly, when you have entirely stateless entities, first of all, like really entirely stateless. I mean, there is some stuff that's entirely stateless. CI CD is probably as close as it's going to come to entirely stateless in that you can entirely reproduce the result and nobody cares that the result is late. Um, for most things, you think they're stateless. They're actually not. You've got in memory state, you've got connections open, you've got a client that's sitting on the other end, and it, when that client gets 500 out, it's like actually someone gets pissed off. So you're not entirely stateless, it's just you don't have a database. You don't have persistent state, per perhaps, but you still have state. So even things that we think of as stateless are important, let alone the things that are actually stateful databases. Databases belong in containers. And not necessarily in the current embodiment that we see, or some of the current embodiments that they see, but we believe very strongly, and we've been running databases and containers for a long time, and I'll get into some details about that in just a second. But when you're talking about databases, when you're talking about data, when you're talking about on disk state, when you're talking about your business, actually, failures matter. And you need to actually understand why the software failed. You need to actually drive to root cause. And this idea that, like, oh, uh, failures don't happen. It's like, oh my god, failures don't happen. Like you talk to people that are like, oh, no, it's fine, everything works. It's like, no, it's not fine. Because everything is working for you today. But in the arbitrary future, it won't work. And, it, and especially if today you think that it always works, when it goes sideways, we will have no tooling to understand what has failed and why. So it absolutely, positively will fail. We can't force ourselves into thinking it won't. And this whole idea, sometimes you, you hit this. I, I don't say this around me. It gives me a stroke, unless you want to give me a stroke. Um, the idea, like, well, just restart the container. Just, yeah! No! No! No, just don't. Okay, this is like the modern incarnation of just reboot your, your PC. No, don't just reboot your PC, goddammit. Debug it. Come on, you're an educated person, right? Or at least you want to act like one around other educated people. Oh, man, I'm in the right room. I wasn't sure. I, you know, you never know, kind of know how the crowd's going to move on that one. It could kind of like rush the stage. Um, but we, we, we can't simply restart our container. We must be able to debug it. We must understand root cause. Um, so it, it, the, the, this ability, the ability to actually root cause failure, this is essential as we move Docker into production. So every time you hear someone talk about Docker in production, that's great. How are we going to understand it when it goes sideways? And so now, just because I, I love failure um, of, of all kinds, I'm, I'm a fail file, I guess, fail -phil I don't know, fail -phil I'm not even sure what it is. Um, if you are playing the Brian Cantrell maritime d disaster drinking game, uh, you want to make sure that your drink is full. Um, because, of course, it's like we're talking about running a ground dock on production. I mean, we've got to have some maritime disasters here to kind of tee things up, right? Now, this image, I, I, frankly, I'm getting sick of this one. Um, this is the MV Reina. Um, this is a legitimate disaster. Um, I'm getting sick of this one because, Brett, you've seen this image before, because TechCrunch and everybody else uses this as their image for any time there's a cloudy day in Docker. It's like, pull request goes ignored for 30 days. And you can see this image. Like, no, come on. I mean, really? Seriously? So we've kind of seen this a lot. And, and look, this is like Google image search container accident plus I feel lucky. Um, this is the MV rain. I mean, this is actually a serious accident. Um, if you're a New Zealander, this is actually the, the, the most serious environmental accident in, in New Zealand's history. Um, and the, actually, and it looks like it's kind of going through a storm and tossing. It's actually not. It's just on a reef. Um, it's actually not that interesting. It ran aground. Um, and like most container ships that run aground, the failure is actually not that intellectually interesting. It ran aground because they drove the boat into the reef. Um, I mean, it's like... You know, it's like it, it takes two miles to go to the harbor, and the second mate has the bright idea, like, well, I can shave a mile off of this, ka-chunk. It's like, all right, well, that's the end of that. Um, so this is like, OK, I get it. It's, an, it's a dramatic image. It's a good-looking image. But uh, I, think, I think we can find a better maritime disaster to be an analog for software failure. And so you see this one a lot. This is the MV Tau, Florida, obviously. This is from 2007. Um, this actually, this vessel did not sink. This is its maiden voyage. <laughs> um, the, uh, which, 
because it's its maiden voyage, like, okay, now we're getting a little bit of an analog for software. This is like, this is before 1.0, clearly. Um, shipped a little too early. Um, this one is interesting. Actually, it encountered heavy seas. Um, the containers may not have been tied down. Actually, no one really knows what happens. Lost 50 containers overboard. Clearly the wrong 50, um, because the entire stack tipped over. This is what's known in the container trade as a stack attack, um, which I think is kind of funny. Um, it's like I definitely think the software and actual shipping container streams are crossing if we're calling this a stack attack. So this is, this is considered to be a classic stack attack. Um, so all right, all right, we're getting closer, we're getting closer to good analogs for software failure. Um, this, th th this is a, a favorite of mine. This is the Cougar Ace. Uh, the Cougar Ace was a motor vehicle carrier, uh, a, or is a motor vehicle carrier, actually, because it did not sink. Uh, and the, the Cougar Ace, um, and it gives you an idea of how tough it is to actually perform shipping. Uh, the Cougar Ace was attempting to rebalance its ballast tanks and move water from one ballast tank to another um, when it, it, it suffered a loss of stability event. Um, it's like, you mean it tipped over? It's like, yeah, yeah, it tipped over. It's a loss of stability event. Okay, yeah. So, I, it, it, and we, was it hit with a wave? Actually, they don't know. It wasn't really root caused. But it actually went to this, it, it listed at 60 degrees and stuck. I mean, it's got 5,000 cars in there. So it actually can't tip all the way over, and it can't be righted. So this thing just started drifting around the North Pacific, um, listing like this, drifted for 100 miles. And they realized, like, actually, the part of the reason I think this is kind of technologically interesting is because actually the cars in here are salvageable. So they actually salvaged all the cars. They actually righted this. Very complicated engineering task. Um, actually, an engineer who was doing this actually involved, died in doing this, because, fell basically do, in doing this. So it, it was, that was the only loss of life in the accident. They righted the vessel, offloaded the vehicles. And the reason this is interesting is, like, as it turns out, and if you're contemplating building a new garage at a 70 degree angle, I don't recommend it. Uh, cars are actually not designed to be stored at arbitrarily steep angles for an arbitrary long. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I. I think we have now divided the world into the just restart it people and the actually debug it people. Um, Adobe, you're out of here. Um, God, I want to get you out of here for the rest of my life. Um, where are now? I, you know what? There we go. I mean, he's like, Adobe's like, I'm going to slow this guy's roll a little. Um, so they, as it turns out, these vehicles are unsalvageable. They all get scrapped. Um, and they were unsalvageable for really interesting engineering reasons. They were, they, these are all unibody con construction. They were very concerned that they were going to encounter weird accidents. The lead batteries did weird things. So even though they were actually new vehicles, just because they had been stored at 70 degrees for three months, bad news. Anyway, kind of interesting. So I think we're getting closer to software failure. Um, this is perhaps the most ironic boat name in history. This is the MOL Comfort. Uh, not so comfortable. If you're like, listen, I'm just a software person, but is that right? Right? It's like, no, 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 that's not right. Uh, the, it, it, container ships are not supposed to do that. Um, and so this container ship actually 200 miles off the coast of Yemen, for reasons that people still don't understand, this just broke in half. Um, seas weren't that wild. You're like, OK, now this is sounding more like software. It's like, OK. Uh, yeah, the jug just broke. Had always like, but everyone else is using Postgres 9.3. It's like, yeah, but yours is broken. And we don't know why. Um, and, and, First of all, Josh, love Postgres, so just, um, um, I, it's, 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 I only, I, I, I kid because I love. Um, the, so this thing, and actually the reason I think this is a, a, an especially good analog for software failure is because this thing broke into two, okay? This broke into a four section and an aft section. Okay, clearly this is going to sink. I mean, you, you obviously can't go to port with just the four section of the boat. But the reason I think this is a good analogy for software failure is that the four section then caught on fire. <laughs> And I cannot tell you how hard I have scoured the, scoured the internet to answer the question, why did the four section catch on fire? Does that not make any sense to anybody else? But as it turns out, actually, interesting kind of lesson, when you actually have massive loss of property but not loss of life, there's actually very little interest in driving the true root cause. So there is actually the final accident reports for this vessel do not know why this thing caught on fire. Um, it just, like, apparently, like, yeah, if you break the boat into two, a bunch of containers are going to burst into flames. It's like, <laughs> okay, what? But it's like, okay, now it's like, is that, wait a minute, is Zookeeper the flames in this analogy? Or, um, so, um, 
and, and you can see the flames. All right, so now we're getting really, really close to software failure. Now we're getting really close to this crazy cascading failure that you seem to only see in production that gives you the cold sweat. But my favorite, my personal favorite example is this one. I'm sorry that the, the photo is so pixelated. I cannot find a high resolution one. So the container ship in question uh, is actually sitting in the back there. Um, and it's actually taking phosphate. It's actually, it's, it's, it's a uh, dry um, ca cargo carrier. That, so does anyone recognize this? So if you grew up in Florida, you might recognize this. This is the Sunshine Skyway. This is the old Sunshine Skyway bridge. Um, the old bridge, obviously. Um, and what happened here is that's the MV Summit Venture in the background. The MV Summit Venture was pulling a classic trick that, yeah, that they're not supposed to do, but they still do, where they, they pump out the ballast and they ride high in the water so they can come into port quickly. With the ballast already pumped out, they can immediately load up and turn. And you're not supposed to do that because you've got loss of control when you pump out the water. They pump out the water. They, it's a foggy morning. The pilot ends up hitting the bridge. They're like, okay, I got it. I got it. They hit the bridge. The bridge comes down. Actually, that's not supposed to happen. Um, you're supposed to be able to hit the bridge, and the bridge is not supposed to come down. The reason the bridge came down is because of the reason that every structure fails in the state of Florida. There was a crooked contractor that built the damn thing, and the, the, the sand and lime ratio was wrong in this thing, and the bridge came down. So that, this is to me like, okay, this is the kind of full cascading failure that we see when we see software failure, because we see software fail in very peculiar ways. In terms of, this is probably a good opportunity to introduce Joyent. Um, we've actually been running containers um, in production at Joyent for a very, very long time. So we've seen a lot of these kinds of failure modes. We've seen the four section burst into flames. Um, and we've been doing this since 2006. We've been, how is it possible, if containers aren't secure, how is it possible that we've been running this in production since 2006? It's because we've been on a different substrate. We've been running on SmartOS. SmartOS is our own operating system. Um, it, it inherits from the OpenSolaris and the Lumos heritage. And it's zones. So we run zones. And we've have, we have run zones for a very, very long time, internet-facing production, and so on. Um, when, with the rise of Docker, we were extremely excited because finally people were understanding what we've understood for a very long time, which is containers are the right way to build things and VMs are the wrong way to build things. Um, I mean, how many more escalations, how many more privilege escalations do you need through your floppy disk controller to convince you that actually virtual, mach virtual machines are the wrong abstraction moving forward? Um, so we've always believed that containers are the right way to build things. Um, and um, the, we've been all containers. We saw the rise of Docker. We were very excited. And we were like, how do we combine the, the stuff that we've been running in production with this great stuff with Docker? And the first thing that we had to do, which was ugly um, or just gritty, um, we had to be able to execute Linux binaries. So we, uh, we implemented a Linux system call table for, for SmartOS, which deserves its own lengthy treatment, but I won't do that here. Um, and we are able to run Linux binaries. So we can run Ubuntu. We can run your, your favorite distros, run Alpine, run CentOS, what have you. Um, and then we, uh, we actually uh, implemented a Docker host, a virtualized Docker host that's data center wide. So we have an entire data center, and we have, uh, we have virtualized the Docker host such that when you do a Docker PS, you see your containers across the entire DC. And when you provision a container, that container runs on the metal on a compute node that we select. So, um, and again, this deserves its own kind of lengthy treatment, but that's kind of the, 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 high order, the high order bit. But we virtualize the notion of the data center. We're running containers on the metal, and we're doing it entirely securely, and we're running the containers that you run today, the Docker containers. So uh, the, the key thing is that when you, are, when, when you are developing Docker and microservices, this is the kind of unstated truth. You are developing a distributed system. That's the bad news. Um, I mean, it's the good news, too, because distributed systems are actually resistant to a certain class of force majeure failure. You're not, I mean, if you have a, a physical node blow up on you, um, you can actually accommodate that failure in a well-designed distributed system. That's the good news. And then it's just a sea of bad news, I'm afraid. Um, you, you get the, the, the scale-out effects, the economic effects, but the, the reality is that distributed systems are very, very hard to debug. Much harder to debug, actually, than, than just strict um, single-system systems. And we've got to be able to debug them. Again, hope is not a strategy. They're hard to debug, and you can't reproduce it in development. Um, one of the differences between distributed systems and non-distributed systems is you can totally give up on reproducing psychotic problems in development. In fact, don't even, if you are in, in, in development, don't even ask the operations people this. They get really upset. It's like, well, I have, it works for me. I don't understand why it doesn't work in production. <laughs> It's like, where do you live so I can fly there and murder you? And this is, a, this is actually the true advantage of working remote, by the way, um, is that you can actually lie at that moment. Um, so it's not going to be reproducible in development. You're going to have to debug it in production. And in terms of Docker, how does Docker shift our thinking? Well, it shifts our thinking in several dimensions. It shifts our thinking because we're developing a distributed system. And that is like, wow, that's hard. And let's come to grips with the fact that the debugging is actually going to be harder. Secondly, we've got a lot more of these things. We need to stop thinking in terms of sick pets. We don't have sick pets. We have sick cattle. And the idea of like, well, just restart the cattle. It's like, no, no, no. 
No, no, no. If you are a rancher, you have a very good relationship with a veterinarian because downer cattle is a very serious problem because you don't know, is this a sick cow or a sad cow or is this mad cow disease? And, and, and we obviously have analogs for mad cow in, in software. So we have to think our thinking from sick pets to sick cattle. And to do that, we need to think about like, how does software fail? Software is, is, is incredibly intricate in that it's both machine and information. It's a beautiful paradox of software, and it can fail in all sorts of spectacular ways. There are lots of different failure modes. I actually like to, and I'm going to take these and recategorize them on, the two, on two axes, implicit versus explicit, programmer aware in the explicit box, programmer not really aware, Fatal, non-fatal. Fatal is not fatal in terms of your business, not fatal in terms of your livelihood. Fatal in terms of the process, the program. The program can't make forward progress. It dies. Non-fatal. The program is still up. It's making forward progress. And you, each of these quadrants is interesting in their own right. I mean, the classic implicit fatal failure is a seg fault. Right? A segmentation violation, you go to access memory that you actually are not allowed to access, and the operating system is like, listen, I don't know what's up with this, but why don't you take a sig seg v, and it, it actually kills your process. Seg Vs, bus errors, uh, panics in Go. It's kind of funny to see, you know, we, in, in the operating system world, we've always thought in terms of panics, Go has kind of resurrected the term. Go is kind of like steampunk for programming languages. Um, <laughs> and, the, and, you know, panic is one of those terms like, oh, okay, we're playing nine now. All right, yeah, like, let me get on my goggles. Let's go to Burning Man. Um, the, uh, Sorry, I spent too much time in the innards of Go. Um, the, you know, the, the, to, to kind of be more modern, you, know, you see a type error, you see an uncaught exception. These are all implicit fatal failures. You can't make forward progress, you die. Um, and we're going to talk about how we debug those. Um, and the, 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 you've got the explicit fatal failures, namely, I die. I'm killing myself. These are actually better than the implicit fatal failures. You, the programmer, have decided my state is too corrupt, namely corrupt, and I cannot continue. Um, I cannot continue reliably. It is, much, again, hope is not a strategy, including for your software. If your state has become corrupt, it is incumbent upon you to die and donate your body to science where it can be debugged. Um, this is why I'm not a physician, by the way. Uh, there'd be the, the, the morgue would be very, very busy. Um, and we would root cause everything, but there'd be a lot of dead people. Um, so th th that's in terms of fatal failure, non-fatal failure, which is the, 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 fa the failure that we see more and more. Fatal failure, non-fatal failure is, I, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm giving this guy a 404, maybe. I'm giving this guy a 500, definitely. That's a failure. Um, I'm returning an error code, what have you. Uh, and then you have the worst of the worst, which is implicit non-fatal failure. Namely, the programmer is unaware that the thing is failing, but it is failing. It's failing by someone's definition of failing. It's giving the wrong answer. It's definitely failing. It's returning the wrong result. Um, you're leaking resources. This is the classic one. You are, you're, you're up, you're operational, but over time, you're leaking resources. And it's like, oh, the garbage collector is my problem. It's like, no, the garbage collector's not your problem. The garbage is your problem, jerk. Like, the, the, the garbage collector, I'm sorry. Like, let's stop pretending that the garbage collector can rewrite your code for you. It's like, stop holding on to the objects. Um, so um, you've, you've got, the, the, and resource leaks are still with us and, live, and with us everywhere. Stops doing work. This is another classic one. Like, well, I'm up. I'm happy. It's like, I don't know. What's your problem? It's like, well, my problem is you're not doing any work. It's like, well, I'm happy. Um, classic way, by the way, you see this when, with things that keep connections open, right? The, the, many, many people fundamentally misunderstand what TCP means in light of a machine reset. If a me machine resets and comes back up and you've got connections open to that machine, you will gladly keep those connections open. If you are not sending any packets over that connection, you'll stay up. It's only when you try to reach that machine, that machine's like, what the fuck is this? Um, and it will RST you, and then you'll reset. So it is very, and this is a very easy mistake to make. And in a distributed system especially, where you can survive systems failure, well, actually, go power off some CNs. Go power off some compute nodes, some virtual machines, and hard fit power those off and see how well you survive. Because if you're not actually doing TCP keep alive, or you're not doing keep alive at a higher level of the stack, you'll find that you just stop doing work and you stop making progress. Um, so you, the, that's a, a classic failure. Or you just perform pathologically. Like, namely, your software sucks, dude. Um, it just, it's terrible. It's like, what is this thing doing to my system? So the, the, there's this whole kind of uh, zoo of failure. Um, and what, let's start with debugging fatal failure, because this is kind of the easiest one in many regards. In fatal failure, the state has become inconsistent. You die, right? This is what I'm saying. This, and this is so old, this idea of failing, and, and failing fatally, 
th this is the first thing we discovered in computing, right? And the first thing that we did is let's take a copy of memory and let's write that out to disk so we can debug it. Let's take our entire state, write it out to disk, and then allow us to actually debug what's going on. And this is an idea that's so old, it dates back to the dawn of computing, a core dump. Magnetic core memory is still with us with a core dump. And this is not as low level as it might imply. I am like, oh, core dump. It's like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm in the 60s. I'm like in 2001. It's like, no, no, no. A, a core dump is actually not as low level as you might think. It is merely a snapshot of your in-memory state, and you should be able to debug from that core dump. In fact, you can very frequently debug from a single failure all the way to root cause, provided you've got the right tooling, the right ethos, the right discipline, and so on. So in terms of containers, post-mortem analysis, that is to say, analyzing these from core dumps, it lends itself very, very, very well to the container model because there's no runtime overhead. We're trying to keep our containers as lean as possible. Container has a fatal failure, core dump. That core dump can then be analyzed entirely separately. And now, and only now, you may restart your container. I give you permission to restart your container because you have this snapshot of state. And from this snapshot of state, you could actually debug it. You've got something to give to a developer or a team of developers to actually go understand it. And this tooling can be made arbitrarily rich. You can have tons and tons and tons of tooling. And frankly, there are not many companies that have really understood this. Um, actually, Microsoft is one of them. So I'm, I'm really excited to see Microsoft in the ecosystem because I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of values around post postmortem debugging. Uh, in, in terms of Docker in particular, um, in, in Triton, which is our system at Joint, um, which is the, our, the Docker system, the virtualized Docker host and so on, we, you're actually running on a smart OS kernel. Um, we had and have and had had uh, very advanced core dump management for a long time. We actually take that core dump. We take that off to another system for, uh, so it's available for analysis. Um, but outside of Triton, this is a bit rocky. Uh, in Docker today, it's, it's still pretty rocky. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a GitHub issue that I point to here, 11740. Um, you can go read all the details there. Um, the, this, I would love to see uh, first class Docker core dump management. This is when Solomon would tell me that I'm welcome to contribute, and I, we do, we need to do that, yes. Um, we should probably just contribute a patch to do this. Um, but I would love to get first class core dump management in Docker, because it's actually extremely valuable, and we have found it to be absolutely invaluable. And in fact, let me just, if you'll forgive me, let me just show you a quick demo of the system that we have built. Uh, we built a system called Thoth, and we're going to see, um, I'm going to actually look at all of my core dumps in the last three hours for all of Joyent. Oh, come on, only one core dump? Um, what you find is when you're running thousands and thousands of machines and, and tens of thousands of services, um, things fail a lot more. It's like, oh, nothing fails. It's like, actually, things fail all the time, as it turns out. Um, and we get, uh, we, when we first started doing this, first started turning this on, we're like, wow, there are a lot of failures here that we need to go debug. We tried to turn it on for the general kind of cloud population. Um, that lasted as long as PHP. PHP just I, I, core dumps all the time, as far as I can, I, as I can tell. So we actually don't take PHP core dumps. That one actually doesn't look very interesting. Um, let's see if we expand out to five hours. Come on. So, the, you know, the software is always reliable at the wrong time. Um, <laughs> OK, there we go. So what I'm looking at now is these are all the core dumps that are over the last 12-hour period. Um, let me show you that again. Uh, and actually, I'm going to look at the, we, we keep what's uh, it's called a, a resource identifier that identifies the service. I can actually see the service that dumped core. And this is kind of interesting. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these, these guys, I'll take this one, um, and I'm going to do a, just get, get the info on this thing. This is just the JSON payload that tells us about this core dump. Now, what you actually want to go do is you want to go debug this thing, right? Like, OK, we've got a core dump. Let's go debug it. And there's actually a, a, a path here. Here's the actual path to the actual dump. But this is not on my file system. This is sitting in our object store. So if I just do an LS on my, on my file system, I'm not going to see it. Um, if I do a, an MLS, which talks to Manta, which is our object store, I'm going to see this thing in the object store. There we go. The network cooperates. Um, we'll do kind of an MLS minus L. So this is talking to our data center in US East in Ashburn. And we can see we've got an 89 meg core file here. And the way that you would traditionally debug this is you would take this thing and you would slurp it out of your object store, S3 or Manta in this case. You would bring it onto your laptop and you would debug it. But um, as I said, we've been doing containers uh, at Joint for a really, really, really long time. And we've been doing it so long, actually, that we, our object storage system, Manta, is actually a container-centric object store. Before all of you understood containers, not all of you, um, before, in fact, not even all of you, uh, you the, your, your buddies, um, let's not talk about you. You all understood containers. Um, but the rest of the world didn't, damn them. Um, and people didn't really understand containers. And, and we got, got a little bit ahead of ourselves. We built an object store that actually was container-centric. And if I want to actually go and, and do something 
something with this thing, instead of actually trying to slurp it down, I can go spin up a container where this object actually lives in US East. Now, for debugging, it's a little bit complicated because it's an interactive kind of idea. So the, the, the thing that I want to go spin up is something that I can interact with interactively. And for that, we've got something called mlogin. And so I'm just going to mlogin. This is a little bit mind blowing.、Um, I'm going to mlogin to this object. So, what we're actually doing is we are going to US East, and now I am on a container、um, in US East, and, I, and in here I have my object and only my object. So, if I look here, I've got a Manta input file, and this is my object. It's sitting here, but I, I don't have anyone else's object, I don't have any, any of my other objects, and I can do arbitrary things to it. I'm in Unix. I can, I can grep for things, I can do whatever. I can also debug them. So, I can actually just debug Manta input file. And what I'm going to actually see here, and I got the, bring, bring up the debugger here. Let's look at the stack trace, no problem. OK, a y yeah, got it. OK, a y we're from do throw, blah, blah, blah. Oh, then we just need to find whoever wrote 0x8870A376 and、uh, get them in here and, and solve the problem. Yeah, well, that's hex, as it turns out.、Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one in the advanced technical track that actually presented hexadecimal, but there it is.、Um, The, um, that's actually not something that you can do anything with because that's a JavaScript frame.、Um, and we actually spent a lot, because postmodern debugging is very important for us, this is a node process, I should make that clear.、Um, we actually spent a lot of time with the postmodern debugging support for node. We did the same thing for Go, actually. And I can actually load a module that we call v8.so, and I can actually get a, a JSTAC,、um, which is a JavaScript stack backtrace. And this shows us our full JavaScript stack backtrace, which is very helpful. But we're just like, man, why stop there? It's like, it's JavaScript. We actually have the entire source code of the thing here because it's interpreted. So we added an option to actually show you the actual source code from the dump of where you're actually dumping core. Now, in this case, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I happen to know that when we go to do throw, this guy is a JavaScript object. And if I JS print that thing, I will actually see the object that's being tossed. That is the exception. So, from this, you can see we've got one failure, only one failure in production. And what you would see is uncaught exception. And you might get a stack trace, you might not. You almost certainly are not going to get, well, maybe you will get enough data, maybe you won't get enough data to actually be able to debug that from the first, from, from the first time it happens. By actually debugging from the core dump, we can debug this thing all the way to root cause after only a single failure. And that's what it means to actually run in production.、Um, all right, so let's actually,、uh, let's moving right along.、Um, So, we, again, would love to see、uh, core, dumps, core dump support, first class core dump support in Docker.、Um, that's fatal failure. I love fatal failure. Fatal failure is great. May all your failures be fatal.、Um, <laughs> be, because it's like, you can't, you know, if you're an operations person, you're like, oh, God, the developers can't weasel out of this one. And you can't. Because, like, you died. I mean, there's no amount of, like, well, did you run it right? No, no, no. It's like, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. Here's your body. You're dead. Debug it. Goodbye.、Um, So that's great. Fatal failure is great. And by the way, fatal failure is so great that you as a programmer should always attempt to make your failures be fatal. Always assert when you can. I mean, again, you, you've got to do this within reason.、Um, but if your failure should be fatal, if your state is corrupt, you should always core dump.、Um, you should abort on uncaught exception if you're using Node. You should look at that core dump if you're using Go、uh, or、uh, other environments as well. The non fatal failure is much nastier because the state is, with fatal failure, you know the state is invalid. With non fatal failure, it's like, Actually, meh. It may or may not be invalid. The state may or may not be invalid. And the system is actually moving.、Um, you are a scientist when you're looking at a core dump. You, you are a,、uh, you're actually Quincy ME when you're looking at your medical examiner when you're looking at a core dump. But when you're looking at a running system, you're a physician. And the, the level of science is much, much lower. And when you're going to debug in vivo, you've got to either extract data from the system of its own volition or by coercion, you've got to instrument the system. So, in terms of explicit non fatal failure, this is explicit non Fatal failure is, a, is, is kind of a loss of stability event for a, a log message, right? You, you've emitted a log message. And that log message can be, can be clutch to understand what exactly is going on. And if the failure is non reproducible or otherwise transient, that is going to become absolutely essential to actually figuring out what happened. And many people, of course, do log analysis. It's been one of actually the great developments in debugging over the last five years is the rise of log analysis, log stash, and so on, because you're often in a distributed system going to need to associate action. One container with action in another. We've had to do this a lot, and log analysis, has been, log analysis has been absolutely clutch for us to do this. 
PS, we do our log analysis with Manto, but that's a different story. Um, but you'd, however you do your log analysis, log stash, what have you, um, this is actually essential. In Docker, you use Docker logs. That's great when the problem is simple, but when the problem gets more complicated, you actually need more sophisticated analysis. The deeper analysis requires you to move those logs out of the container into something that's dedicated to that analysis. And Docker is not actually prescriptive about, is prescriptive about how this is done. You can pull them from within a process from within a container. Um, it's like, oh, no, a container should only have one process. It's like, no, no, stop, stop with that, please. Stop with the container should only have one process. If we are debugging you, there's going to be another process called what the hell's wrong with you process. Um, so, this, of course, this is why we have Docker exec, which is great. Um, you can pull the logs from a container by sharing a volume. Um, the thing you shouldn't do, and if you do do, you should feel dirty about, is pulling the log directly from the Docker host. And so, per permit me a rant. Um, we need to stop going into the Docker host and dorking with containers. Uh, the, the, it, is, it is an anti-pattern, because in, in, in the, the traditional Docker model, a, a Docker host is a virtual machine that runs your containers. And if you develop a dependency on going into that Docker host and screwing with things to figure out what's wrong, then you are confining your containers to live in a VM. Your container can't run on the metal, certainly not in a multi-tenant environment, because every time you go into the Docker host, you completely compromise the security model of Docker. Don't do that, or at least feel bad about it. Um, and see, we do not want to create a VM, VM dependency. And if you actually, if, if, if those of you who are kind of addicted to this, and I kind of tease this out with some people, the reason that people do this, it begins to resemble pets. Your Docker host is your pet. It's like the animals are walking upright. Didn't anyone read Animal Farm? Um, so. Uh, be careful about this. Don't, I understand that, you know, obviously you can't say both, and I think in, Docker, in the Docker community we tend to do this a little too much. We tend to say you're doing it wrong and patch is welcome in the same sentence. Um, that's really not fair um, because you're allowed to pick one of those. You can't say you're doing it wrong, and by the way, there's no right way to do it, so patches are welcome. Um, the, but just be careful about this and be mindful of the fact that you don't want to have a hard dependency on the VM. In terms of an implicit non-fatal failure, um, the, when you have, so the, you've got your log analysis, that's great. What if there is no log emitted? What if the thing just sucks and you don't know why? It's like, well, that doesn't happen to me. It's like, okay, yeah, that doesn't happen because no one wants you in the room when it happens. Um, but th this is going to happen to your software. It's going to suck. No one knows why. And um, we need to be, obviously, you want to induce fatal failure when you can. When you can't, you've actually got to go coerce the system. You've got to go instrument the system against its will. Um, and instrumenting systems against its will is something I've been doing for a long time, a long, gleeful time. Um, the, when I die, I'm going, to I'm going to discover that actually the software and the machines are in charge. I'm going to be in a lot of trouble because I've done a lot of unholy things to a lot of software. Uh, in particular, I developed along with two colleagues something called Dtrace that allows you to dynamically instrument production systems. Um, and, in, uh, and I'll show you Dtrace here in, in, in just a second. Because um, Dtrace actually, with, with Triton, you can actually go run Dtrace against your Docker container. And I want to show you quickly what that looks like. Um, so let's come back to my ultra-wide terminal because it has to be ultra-wide because it's Docker. Um, you know, God actually did mean 80 columns for a reason, but I digress. Um, so um, I, I'm going to run Docker Info here. Docker Info, when I run Docker Info, I'm not talking to anything to my laptop. I'm not talking to a video. I'm talking to like an actual data center um, that is running in, uh, in US East. And if I run Docker PS, I'm going to see my containers. And this is my contain these are my containers that are running DC wide. Um, and so if I do, I've, I'm running a couple of things. I love Alpine. It's been great to see all the Alpine love up here. Um, I love Alpine. I got Debbie and Jesse. That's for Jesse, wherever she is. Um, and I, I've got the Google Node.js hello um, little container, which I, I kind of like. Um, and I'm going to go inspect this thing. Um, and what I'm going to see is that, that the, I've got an actual IP address. And one of the things with Triton is that we actually give you a real IP address. We think IP addresses are a good idea. Um, we think the, the whole inner networking thing is going to really catch on. So we actually give you a full networking stack. Um, you actually have a full proper IP address. Um, and if you ask for a port open, we'll close all the other ports, but you actually have a full proper IP address. So I, I can see I've got an actual IP address here. Um, and so actually, if I pop up into another window um, and just let's go curl this thing, um, and I think it's on 8080, I'm going to see hello world. OK, great, that's running. What I'm going to do is docker exec uh, minus it, this container name, wherever there that is. And let's actually go, uh, not bish, don't do that. So sorry. Um, we're going to go in and actually execute bash in this container. Um, so now I'm, I'm in my container. Um, and I'm, I, you know, whatever I've got, I'm, I'm running Linux, as far as you know. Um, I, but I'm actually sitting on a smart OS kernel. So in addition to my node app here, um, I actually have um, under slash native, I have actually all the native smart OS tooling. Um, and so in particular, if I um, export my path to be my path, 
plus uh, slash native native spin should be native user spin. And now I've got which dtrace. I should have dtrace there. So there I've got dtrace, and now I can actually dtrace. And let's go instrument all of my Linux system calls, for example. And let's aggregate by probe func and run that. And now I'm going to actually go hit this guy. And we're going to see some output here um, where I can actually go. I actually have dtrace on Linux now. Um, congratulations, Linux. You now have clean water. Um, use it wisely. Um, and, and we use dtrace a lot. Um, this is obviously a, a, a super brief demo. I'm happy to give anyone a much longer demo of dtrace, obviously. Um, we use dtrace a ton inside of Join to, to, to debug those, the nastiest of the nasty problems. Those are the problems in the, that left quadrant, the implicit non fatal failures. I hope that none of your failures are implicit non fatal failures. The reality is that hope is not a strategy, that's the H word, um, and that you will have implicit non fatal failures. When you do, you have the right to have all the tooling available at your disposal to actually understand that. That includes Dtrace and the Triton tooling. With that, thank you very much. The gentle, sonorous song stylings. Of Mr. Brian Cantrill. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Brian, for, for giving us this wonderful lullaby. And, and or a fight or flight such, reaction. Such beautiful music in stereo. Ladies and gentlemen, I do have a request. We must clear out the room because Solomon is planning a big hoedown for the finale, and it's going to be in the middle of all of this. We're going to clear out this wall. This wall will cease to exist. So, in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for being part of DockerCon. You've been absolutely marvelous. My name is Scott Fulton. Take care, everyone. We'll see you online.